You're listening to the Mind Over Finger podcast, episode number 75. Welcome to the Mind Over Finger podcast, discussions on mindful music making, efficient practice, and building a purposeful career. And now your host, Dr. Renee Paul Gauthier. Hi, everyone. I hope you're doing great. Today is a special episode. I'm bringing you a conversation I had on another podcast, the Awesome Condition Musician podcast with the equally awesome David Cartellano. David is an ACSM certified exercise physiologist and has a bachelor in exercise science, and he's on a mission to build stronger, more resilient, and more creative musicians. Our conversation is episode 57 of the Condition Musician podcast, and it came out back in June. It was so much fun talking with David, and I'm really grateful he's letting me share our conversation here with you today. I hope that you'll check out the podcast and subscribe because David brings you amazing guests and incredible content. So if you're a musician that wants to feel better so you can perform better, the Condition Musician podcast is for you. And before we dive into today's episode, I want to remind you that the doors for the next round of the Music Mastery Experience are closing in two days. So it's not too late to book your call with me and sign up. We start on Monday, September 21st, and I'm so excited because the Music Mastery Experience is the place to be to take everything about your playing to the next level. These challenging times can actually be an incredible opportunity for you to kick things into gear and be ready to face the music, win that dream job, and perform like never before when our industry gets back in full action. You're going to completely make over how you practice, how you prepare for performances, you're going to transform your mindsets, how you approach music making, and you're going to experience amazing results. The participants have called this program life-changing, and they've seen incredible wins and transformation in their practice and performance. And as I said, time is running out. So if this is something that you'd like to experience and you want to get those incredible results, go to mindoverfinger.com slash MME and book a call today so you and I can chat about making it happen for you. I'll have more details for you at the end of the show and in the show notes, of course, but don't delay. Once again, it's mindoverfinger.com slash MME to start an incredible journey to amazing practice and optimal performance. So today is really fun as the tables are turned and you'll hear a bit more from me as I'm the one being interviewed. Among many things, David and I talk about my own injury experience, how having a sense of introspection can prolong and save your career, how to stay motivated in your work, and we discuss how starting with your fundamentals and with a beginner's mind can be crucial to getting past a rut. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with David Cartellano from the Condition Musician Podcast. Let's go to the show. Hello and welcome to the Condition Musician. My name is David and today we have the host of the Mind Over Finger podcast, aka the podcast I wish I knew about in undergrad. She is a world-class violinist that has performed across the United States and Canada. She is a coach, a writer, a music clinician, a yogi, a wife, a mom, a sushi lover. Ladies and gentlemen, can I please introduce to you the mind behind Mind Over Finger, Dr. Renee Paul Gautier. Thank you so much for having me, David, and thank you for this amazing introduction. You are so welcome. You are so well-deserving of it. Guys, I'm, if you can't tell, I'm geeking out because whenever <laughs> I see people who actually focus on the art of practicing, first of all, it reminds me so much of the art of getting over injury, which, by the way, is an art. And it's so awesome to see that there are people out there who are teaching how to practice instead of just mindlessly going to the practice room with no windows and just sitting down and playing the same piece over and over without actually learning anything. So I'm super stoked because I'm going to get a lot of takeaways from this. And yeah, let's, let's, let's jump right in. So 
uh, Renee, do you mind if I call you Renee? Yes, please. That's perfect. Awesome. Awesome. How did your musical journey begin? My parents are musicians, so that's where it started. Strangely enough, my dad is the violinist, but my mom, who was the pianist, is the one who always made me practice. And she was never a performer herself, but she started a school of music in my hometown, which became really big and it was nonprofit. For her, it really was a mission to get music to as many people as possible because she herself felt like she had missed a, an opportunity to become a performer. So she wanted to make sure that as many people as possible could access um, high quality, affordable music lessons. So the, the people at that school could get uh, with your lessons came theory, solfege, dictation. There was a bunch of ensembles, orchestras, uh, recorder ensemble, everything you need was there. So I pretty much grew up under her desk and she made me practice and in ways related to what I'm doing right now is in practicing with her every day, it really was mindful practice. Not a minute was wasted. Someone was guiding my attention and directing my, um, you know, my movements, making me think, not allowing me to settle for mediocrity. There was no mindless playing. You know, it was like a three-hour lesson every day for many years. And I also had a violin teacher starting at the age of nine who was a really wonderful violinist. I interviewed him in the episode, I believe it was episode 25, if I remember correctly. His name is Jean-François Rivet. So if you want to understand a little bit more about me, you can listen to that episode. And he um, always pushed me to explore and really see music as part of my life, not just something you do in the practice room, but that the person that you are contributes so much to the musician that you are. Every book you read, every meal you savor, you know, all of these things contribute to make you a better musician. And I, later in life, after graduating and, you know, taking auditions, and I did a lot of competitions and learned a lot through that. And when I started teaching, this is when I start to really realize what a gift it was to have had these notions on how to practice efficiently and that not everyone had that. So now when you're facing maybe a little bit older uh, person, like a you know high school, college, how do you start to teach them to implement those things in the practice room? So that became my mission in life to figure out a way. And uh, all of my doctoral studies, the research was uh, on that and, um, you know, trial and errors in the, hopefully not too many errors in the, <laughs> in the studio with my, t my students, um, you know, just thinking in any way that I, I could increase the mindfulness in practice, you know, you want more bang for your buck. So, um, yeah, so this is kind of how it happened for me through a lot of experience as a performer as well uh, and, and doing some research. And um, I, I just love it so much. I mean, I have right here, I can see it, the quote from Itzhak Perlman, like, when you teach, you learn. And I just love keeping on learning from my students every minute. I, t I learn all the time so much from them. So I'm very grateful that I have this chance to uh, exchange with them and we learn from each other. That is such an amazing perspective. First of all, love the violinist. He's, he's my favorite. I've been listening to um, his, uh, his recordings for Paganini and the 24 Caprices. And I just, I've been listening to them with my jaw open the whole time. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, someday I'm going to sound that good. Maybe, possibly. But at the end of the day, it's like you said, it's about not, not trying to sound like somebody else, but being the artist you are and having that influence your music as deep as, as much as I want to sound like Jimi Hendrix or Jimmy Page. Yeah. <laughs> At the end of the day, I'm only going to sound like a cheap imitation of them. Even if I get to their level, I'm only imitating them. Where does David Cardellano step into that? So um, that's really cool. And I also love how you grew up and your, both of your parents were musicians. That's usually, I think, how a lot of us start. Um, mm -hmm. And my parents were musicians, so I do understand. But unlike, um, unlike you, my parents are very much, they were the folk choir musicians. They would lead the choir at, on Sunday. And as far as practice, 
the practice was show up to the gig, get the music in front of you, go. And for me, that's something I always struggled with simply because I was so used to having in a gig, just having the music in front of me. And it's like, all right, we got 30 minutes until mass starts. Like, let's go through the parts. Let's hit the songs, go bang, 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 get it done, make it sound good, have a whole lot of fun and do the whole thing next week. So Mm. struggling, I think something that contributed to me getting injured in undergrad was struggling because I never knew how to practice. And I'm sure that's something you see with a lot of your students. Yes. I mean, I even saw it with myself. As a freshman, I got a really bad tendonitis. So we can talk about injuries here. Absolutely. And oh, yeah. this came from me. I mean, it's a freshman year. All of a sudden, you're playing music all the time. I had entered some competitions in I just uh, I was a little bit stupid. I would walk in and say, I'll just play through my concerto before my first class. I would walk in the practice room, no warm up, and just play through my concerto. And, um, then, you know, it's like the, the freshman tendonitis. I don't know if everyone gets it, but I really learned from that. First of all, I learned that you need to seek therapy. You need physical therapy. <laughs> you need to talk to a doctor you need to take it seriously. It's, it will go away if you really nurture it. I mean, not nurture the injury, but if you really nurture yourself. Absolutely. Uh, I found a therapist that I had absolute thrust, uh, trust in. Mm-hmm. Sorry, you just got a, a little bit of the French Canadian here. When <laughs> I start thinking in French and I can't speak English, um, <laughs> I found a therapist that I trusted and I just did everything she said. and. Um, um, yeah, I mean, I, I have a history of finding therapists that I trust. And I think it's, if I may just say, I think it's really important because when we're injured, we're extremely vulnerable Absolutely. mentally as well. Mm-hmm. So, so if the person who's taking care of your body is someone that you also feel you can entrust your, um, you can entrust your heart to them, then I feel like it speeds up their recovery. So, um, so I did everything. I stopped playing for a while. I did some uh, acupuncture and that really helped. But then I learned that you need to warm up. You need to be very meticulous about taking care of your body. I started exercising. I started eating better. And I, you know, there's, I'm a little bit less in shape now. I have two kids. I have a little bit less time, <laughs> but the years where I was an avid runner and lifting weights and doing lots of yoga were years where I was 100% injury free. So it's uh, really important to really important to put a lot of thought into um, how, well, yes, how you warm up, how you practice taking breaks, just, just being very mindful about those things is important. Yeah. And thank you for sharing that. It's such, it's such a relief when I see people are willing to talk about their injuries because there's some sort of silence when you're injured. You don't want anybody to know about it. You might lose your job. You might lose, you know, that audition because they'll say, oh, well, she's wearing a wrist brace. So mm, not so sure. And there's so much silence around it. So thank you for opening up about that. And I absolutely believe you, like as far as selecting your doctor, if you wouldn't have your doctor watch your kids, you probably shouldn't be seeing that doctor. <laughs> really? That's, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. They, they must listen to you. And it's difficult if, if the therapist can only see you for five minutes and say, okay, you're a musician. Well, just stop playing and do these exercises. You should be fine. No, you, you really got to have that connection. And it's really important. And at the same time, I think, like you said, you know, warming up, staying in shape, as begrudgingly as some people want to say, it does matter. It does make a difference because at the end of the day, yes, you can go to the doctor and they can help you fix yourself. But, at the, but like I said, at the end of the day, if there's a rock underneath your pillow and you sleep on it every night, you could go to, you could go to the doctor. Yes. But I think first you got to remove the rock and that mm. would be the poor practice habits, the poor exercise habits. So I know you coach a lot of students. What habits do you usually see that they have that you think is like, okay, that's the number one thing they got to work on? They don't think. That's the f- <laughs> they just... I love it. I mean, I see a lot of, uh, I'll gesture here, you know, like the arms move. Mm-hmm. And then there's a lot of wishful thinking. I'll just keep moving and I'll get it. But that's not how it works. Like I said, you want more bang for your buck. And the more thought you'll put into 
solving problems, figuring out the most efficient way to work. I mean, you, you play guitar. You know what I'm talking when I say hand frame? Mm -hmm. If mm -hmm. you spend time meticulously working on your hand frame, you're going to save so much energy. You'll get more accurate. Um, you have frets. That's not fair. <laughs> we yeah. we have to think about inflammation. <laughs> um, but we spend less time tuning than you guys, so it's kind of a trade-off. Um, but the more thought and planning you put into how you uh, want to think about your movements, how you go about solving problems, you will get more results on your instrument and you will um, work a lot less. It's good to want to be lazy, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I love if, it. I love it. Put, put a lot of effort so you can be lazy. No, I mean, you, you know what I mean. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but. No, that's, that's great. I love that because I think it, there's almost, again, and it's a, in this music culture, whether it's in, you know, fusion jazz or in R&B or in classical, the more hours you put in, the better of an artist you are. Oh, well, I practiced for 24 hours yesterday. Well, that's literally impossible, first of all. And second of all, why would you want to practice for longer if you can get more done in a shorter amount of time? Because not only do you get to, you know, do other things like eat sushi and watch Netflix and walk your dog, you can, you're also bulletproofing yourself against injury. And that tendonitis, mm -hmm. if you do have tendonitis or a problem like that, if you can reduce your practice time Again, that's removing the rock beneath your pillow before you talk to the doctor. So yeah. what do you think is a really great way? And I, I know you said think, which I totally agree with, which I love. How should young musicians be thinking when they approach an empty practice room? Hmm. That's a good question because there are so many things to think about. Um, I like to talk about beginner's mind. Mm -hmm. So a beginner, well, there's two things. I, I have a, a model that I use with the students that I call the deep practice model. And it's really a combination of my experience and my research and trying to distill some big concepts and get them to be palatable enough for people to kind of understand it within a few months and start to apply it. I mean, even before a few months. But um, I, I would start with bare awareness, which is paying attention without judgment. What are you hearing? What are you experiencing? How does it feel? Things like this. And then beginner's mind, I see it as the, the way I ex explain it in the model is two birds, uh, not two birds, the two wings of one bird, right? So on one side, you have this curiosity, this thirst for knowledge, um, also not taking anything for granted. So uh, you're doing a shift. I like to use that example, for example, as an example. Um, yeah, I need to like really work on my English right now. <laughs> All right, that's okay. So you're using, let's say you're doing a shift. Oftentimes, when you develop a, a certain, you know, a, amount of skill, you feel like an expert. So you just kind of shift and it's not working and you do it a million times. And then I like to say, no, 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 go back to lesson number one. You right. know, what is proper shifting? And then a lot of times students and even myself occasionally will realize that I am neglecting a basic uh, fundamental aspect of shifting. And then if I just go back to lesson number one, it fixes it. I was either just not using proper form. So that's the other thing. So you have this curiosity, this thirst, but also this uh, beginner's mind of staying humble, of monitoring the fundamentals. So this really helps um, cultivating patience and really bring a lot of awareness in your work. And of course, with that, you want to put some uh, really good strategies to solve problems. I mean, one analogy I love if you indulge me here for a second I took that from one of my absolute favorite book which is the seven habits of highly effective people by Stephen oh, Covey I love that book and so you know which one I'll talk about it's the launching a rocket mm -hmm. so when you're trying to either create a new skill or create a habit or even more difficult change a habit change your hand frame your bow hold uh, 
your embouchure. I know that wind players talk a lot about embouchure. <laughs> um, the amount of millions of liters of you know fuel it requires to launch the rocket, it's massive. And it's so much energy. I mean, you see it when they launch. It goes fast, but you look at it, it looks like it's going slowly. Uh, and then it's just burning fuel like crazy. But once it's in orbit, it requires very little energy. It's, you know, it goes, it, it just uses the momentum that it has. And, you know, with all the formulas, whatever, to, to um, with the gravitational pull. But we neglect the amount of energy we just have to put in initially to create the good habit. So I would say bear awareness, really listening without judgment. So assessing objectively. Beginner's mind, monitor your basics, stay curious, keep exploring, keep internalizing everything. And but then be patient and don't be afraid to just spend a lot of energy to establish some really, really solid basis. Even though it feels like you're not going far for a while, you're really implementing really solid um, hygienic <laughs> habits <laughs> that that once you have them then you can just ride you know the momentum and and you're in orbit and things are easier that's so awesome and i love how you talk about approaching practice with a beginner's mindset with bare awareness like not beating yourself up if you haven't gotten it i i've seen so many patients the ones that get better are usually the ones that say, you know what, I'm going to try this out. I'm going to take a positive attitude. I'm going to try it. Okay, this hurt a little. All right, I'm going to back off. But then I'm going to try something new and different. And they think about the exercises and they think about getting better compared to, unfortunately, the patients who would go to physical therapy and they just never leave. They're always there doing the same exercises. And they're like, why is it not getting better? And I'm like, whoa, whoa, slow down slow down, focus on the exercise, focus. Does this hurt? What's this doing for me? Oh, I don't want to do that. Well, tough, real tough. So when you practice, so like the whole idea of being mindful and aware, it doesn't just apply to practicing. It applies to everything. It applies yeah. to getting over an injury. It applies to, you know, auditioning. It applies to going on a date. You know, that's, these are things and necessary life skills that we as musicians, we get to take advantage of because it's stuff we just do. And if we do it right, it really, really benefits us. And I love how you talk about launching that rocket and how much effort it takes. And one thing that I listened to in one of your recent podcasts was your commit to 10 rule, which is mm. awesome. And I can't wait to use it uh, because I really, really like that idea. It's the little consistent habits that get us off the ground. And if you can elaborate on it, I, I'd love it. I'm so glad you're asking about this because I actually was thinking about that in my walk this morning. Yeah. Because I was thinking I should add one word to this and it would be the word delight. Yeah. It, it should be commit to like delightful 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. Because what I find is and I was discussing this with some clients sometimes and I'm looking to my left because my violin case is open with the violin sitting there. <laughs> sometimes we don't want to start practicing because inside this case, we associate emotionally frustrations, uh, feeling that we're not good enough, that it's not going to work. We're, you know, I mean, we were talking about how we bypass words. We go straight into these emotions of feeling less than and frustration. And we just need to reconnect with why, why we played this. This was fun at some point. This, this was something that brought us pleasure. So if you don't feel like practicing, um, I think it was the episode about motivation, right? Where I was talking that yeah. motivation yeah. comes from action. You don't just sit there and feel motivated. It will come from moving. And sometimes you just need to tell yourself, I'm going to go and I'm going to commit to 10 minutes. And after 10 minutes, if I don't feel like practicing, I'll just walk away. But then this morning I was thinking, actually, we should commit to 10 minutes of delight first. I'm just going to pick up my instrument and play anything I feel like. Mm -hmm. But we've just talked about maybe not the run through of a concerto when you haven't warmed up yet. <laughs> but Take 10 minutes to yourself and play something, anything that comes to mind that you feel like playing to just reconnect with this pure joy, joy of playing your instrument. 
and then see where that takes you. But just taking a little bit of time to dig in and, you know, let the joy come out. Then I think I would feel more prepared to practice for sure. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. I absolutely love it because music is fun. That's why we do it. That's why we got into it because someone gave us an instrument or told us to open our mouths and make a note. And we said, Oh, Oh, I like that. That makes me feel good. That's why we're doing it. Mm Y'all no matter if you are a classical musician who plays like God knows how many gigs a week, or if you are just a regular musician or like not regular, um, if you're uh, more of an amateur musician who plays church gigs or, or plays in a bar, you know, you do music because you love it. That's Mm -hmm. why you got into it. And I see so many musicians. It's so sad. They burn themselves out on the thing they love because their forearms hurt so badly from playing over and over again, from taking in. And we can definitely talk about this, the judgment of other people on their journey of becoming an artist Um, and they're practicing and practicing and practicing and they just end up burning themselves out and then they take their instrument and they put it in a case and then they don't touch it for one year, two years, or maybe they stop. Um, and it's sad. I mean, if you want to change your career, you can change your career. No one says you have, have to be a musician, but it's sad when I see musicians burn themselves out over music and they love music. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something we can definitely, definitely, um, elaborate on. What's your experience with, you know, uh, seeing uh, musicians who might be on the edge of burnout, who might be on the edge of practicing too much or taking in other people's opinions? Oh, that's hard. A big component of what I advocate is self-compassion. Mm-hmm. And take it from someone who is much better about it now, but I was extremely harsh with myself. The The negative self-talk was really, really severe. And you know, I, I mean, I don't want to say debilitating because I was still functioning, <laughs> but um, then you come to a point where it's no longer enjoyable, exactly what you just said. And uh, I remember several years ago coming to a point where I was right before a performance and just asking myself, why am I here? I'm so nervous. I'm not looking forward to this performance at all. And what's the point? And then I realized that, sure, as a professional musician, there's, um, you know, there's ramifications such as your income (laughs) is attached to it. So yes, there are expectations, but what's really interesting is this dichotomy between the expectations are there from the outside, but also from the inside and the expectations that we put ourselves, the unreasonable expectations that we put on, on ourselves do not improve our playing. (laughs) You said it. And so I remember being back there and I thought, I don't know. I, you know, sometimes you have these moments and it just hits you right there. And I thought I need to play from a place of joy and love. And that's all I start thinking, joy and love, joy and love, joy and love. I need to play from a place of joy and love because I knew the piece. We had rehearsed it and I was nervous because I wanted to do well and you want your colleagues to think highly of you. Of and all of this stress has the opposite effect. Mm-hmm. And at that point, it was almost a moment where I, I just kind of wanted to quit the violin or wanted to quit the unreasonable expectations. And in that moment, it worked. <laughs> so the... I I just ended up having such a great time in this performance because I really realized I'm going to play the way I'm going to play. And the the one way to play my best is just to let it happen. And the way to ruin it all is to worry about it. So uh, in many ways, it's not an easy exploration, but it's one that I think we need to do to really kind of prepare your best uh, diligently every day. It's exactly what you said earlier. It's, you know, it's the, a coin plus one coin plus one coin plus one coin every day. Then you have a fortune, Uh, but trust your work and really find out how you can reconnect to why you're playing music, uh, what it brings to you. I mean, it could be as simple as putting it on paper, writing it on a, a sheet of paper with the list, I became a musician because of this and that. Or uh, a visualization exercise that I I have some clients do is uh, in students. um, 
think back of that moment that you know that moment where you had like the hair on the back of your neck rising for me it was youth orchestra and I was like this is amazing that's what <laughs> I want to do for a living like think back at that moment and trying to recapture some of that it's not as simple as that because yeah. once it's your career like I said there's so many uh, pieces in place to complete the puzzle but there are ways to really implement a little bit more of that i think yeah yeah and it's like you said it's it's not just loving yourself overnight because that mm -hmm. doesn't happen and we'd like to think it happens like we'd like to be a character in a movie where they go to bed they have a dream they wake up they love themselves and are completely different no nah. No, nah, that takes time. That takes time. And like practicing, it takes conscious effort. It takes effort mm -hmm. saying, oh, this is why I love this. And especially in, in the days where you don't want to pick up your instrument and you're like, I just, I'm just going to play a sound and I hope it sounds good. And whatever my colleagues say, you know, I'm just going to take it home with me and I feel sad about it. Guys, loving yourselves that that's that's when you need it most. That's when you need to practice it. It's a skill. It doesn't just happen. And yes. yeah, I just, I really love how you talked about, you know, uh, confronting that fear before your performance where you're like, well, it's either I give up the unrealistic expectations of others or I give up my instrument. And I see so many, so many injured musicians. It's such, it's such a cycle where you are holding yourself to someone else's standard, which is why you are playing so much which is yeah. why your elbow is hurting. So I could treat the elbow. I can show you exercises for the elbow if you want, but unless you trace it back to the love of yourself, of yourself as an artist, as a musician, as a human being, if you don't address this part, it's going to be really tough working on your elbow. And that's, I, that's one of the reasons I left the medical field because I'm like, we're not addressing the whole problem here. It's one thing that's interesting too with self-esteem is that... Mm -hmm we beat ourselves up or self-confidence or self-comfort, all of these yeah. things. We beat ourselves up if we don't have it. <laughs> <laughs> and I heard an analogy. I forget where I got this, but I thought it was really smart that it's, it's a little bit like um, you can't change the thermostat too quickly. So you can't go from, I hate myself to, I love myself. Your brain would react uh, against that thought. It's too right. sudden, but you can make conscious, um, you know, the conscious decision to go that from, I hate myself, which is not an objective assessment right. to, well, I am. Exactly. And you, and you go from there. Um, it's, it's like a tree, you know, you can't be angry at the tree because it grows only so fast. So it's, it's like you say, it's an exploration and you, you just got to, you know, we can't beat ourselves up for not changing overnight. We just can, yeah, I mean, now we're, we're circling back, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, it's every day. It's so one conscious decision after the next. You can't get angry at a tree. <laughs> not growing fast enough. I want to take you back in time to the old clinics I worked at and just explain that to my patients for me, please. Exactly in the way that you did it. Because we all want the quick pill. We all want to be the amazing yeah. musician. We all want to walk in the practice in the practice room, memorize our entire concerto, walk out, have the best performance of our lives, and then look at our arms, which feel completely fine. It doesn't work like that. Yeah. It takes time. It takes effort. And it's going to be okay. You're going to mess up along the way. What do you think students or your clients usually, like, what's their first pitfall when working with you? Hmm. Two things. I mean, first of all, this could be many, but if I could say two things. Not giving themselves enough time. Okay. I and like not trusting themselves enough. Ooh, like it even more. <laughs> because it takes time. I mean, I just was talking about the rocket and how much fuel it takes. So it takes time. It takes a lot of a concept. I talk a lot on the podcast is you have to take ownership of your learning experience. I can give you all of the notions, but the inner search is yours. It's all on you and going with not trusting themselves enough Sometimes people look for a system, step by step, and it's 
just not how it works. You can have strategies. Yes, there can be a system in place, and I provide that. But within that system, you have to figure out your place. Um, and sometimes I find that, for example, you explain a concept to a student, and then they come back the next week, and it hasn't really changed, and they only have questions. And uh, um, I don't, I didn't know if I was doing this right. Uh, am I doing this right? Am I doing this right? And then if you take the time to just ask questions, well, how does it feel? Mm-hmm. What does it feel like when you do that? And then, then, you know, yeah, you have to start trusting yourself. So taking the notions from your teacher, your guide, your coach, and then ask yourself like, okay, what does that mean to me? Let's explore. Let me try that. And I'll try, I'm not going to take it at uh, 100% face value and try to do what I think she wants or what she's saying, but see beyond the words how that applies for me. Am I making any sense? I hope you I am. You are making so much sense. Okay, oh good. my goodness. If I got a quarter for every time I heard, am I doing this right? In clinic, I would be able to pay off my student debt. Oh my goodness. And you're <laughs> so right. It's, it's about trusting yourself and saying, okay, am I doing this right? Wait. Before I ask Renee, I'm going to ask myself, wait, does this feel right? Mm. And then it will lead you to maybe not the answer you're looking for, but a better question. And that's something that I just, I loved it when my patients would, they would do, you know, an exercise and they'd look at me and they would go, is this? And I go, what, what do you think? Mm. And they went, yeah, you know, it feels good here. I, I have a little tightness here. I'm like, great, now let's address that. So now we can go and address a deeper question. Because wondering if you're right all the time, most likely that there really is no right. There's and no then you, right. you can ask yourself, but if I knew the answer, what would it be? Yeah. Oh my and, gosh. And then that's sometimes cool. you're like, oh, wait, there's a little voice inside that's trying to tell me something and I'm not listening because I'm waiting for the outside validation. But we all have a really great amount of inner wisdom. So I think we can all tap. Yes, we need guidance. And sometimes you, someone needs to teach you how to shift for yeah. sure. But I think that sometimes the thinking process for some students stops there. Yeah. But they have to go home and think about it and try and explore and see for themselves. And um, so sometimes that's, I think that's what's missing. And it's exactly what you say. I mean, a- another quote I love that I will butcher by Tony Robbins, which is like, <laughs> question, questions are the answer. And if you want a better quality life, you have to start asking better quality and an- questions. Yes. Absolutely. I think it's true. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, that's something I've gotten from mentors in physical therapy, mentors in business, mentors in personal development. It's not about the answers you're looking for. It's about choosing the questions you want. Mm. And living by that principle, because music, music is so poorly defined. What sounds quote unquote good to some person might sound quote unquote bad to another. So how are you supposed to get an objective answer? And the answer is that you don't, you have to Mm -hmm. ask better questions and then make the decision as an artist, as a performer to express that. And um, yeah. It's something that I've had to figure out myself as someone who is not a classical musician by any standard, who loves it, but like is nowhere near someone who is just finally starting to, after years of just playing gigs and playing gigs and learning by doing, I'm starting to say to myself, you know what? I actually want to go back to the basics and I want to learn from the beginning, learn how to practice, learn how to actually hold my guitar, you know? Um, because it's just something that it's, it's always been from the hip, even on some of the coolest gigs I've ever done, where we redid albums by the Beatles, note for note, sound for sound. They were great. But again, it was all from the hip. I wasn't thinking about it. And mm. I want to start asking myself better questions as a musician so I can grow into a, not a better artist, but a more authentic version of myself. So I'm able to express what I hear in my head. And I think that's what I wish for all people to do. And if you're injured, like, then that's sort of stopping it. So yes. in a way, the conditioned musician is, it's kind of my personal development program as well. I don't think people realize it, that. And you know, one other way that we are conditioned, if I am to get a little preachy here, Go is ahead. 
with our careers. Yeah. Oh, and my goodness. so often I, I see it as um, in 2020, anything is possible. I mean, 2020, everything is a little crazy, but <laughs> things are changing rapidly. Mm-hmm. And I feel like, I mean, the world is changing and the newer generations really can ask themselves a question, not, oh, I, I want to be a musician. It could be like, what kind of musician do I want to be? Where do I want to perform? What do I want to do? And then go after that because everything is possible. You, uh, I know I think back, back in my days, uh, <laughs> you just, you just, you want to be a musician? Well, you go get an undergrad degree and then you get a grad degree and then you play or you teach or you, um, uh, I don't know, record in studio. Actually, it was never that way because there were lots of people doing so many cool things, but you heard less about it because there was no social media. And, you know, if you're not sur- subscribing to the right magazine or journal, you don't see what those people are doing. But nowadays, we're really seeing that anything is possible. Anyone can create their own career. And it comes with asking yourself the question, what do I want? So there's definitely, I mean, if you want to become an orchestra musician, there's a path I could recommend for sure. There are some things that are beneficial, but you are not limited to being an orchestra musician if you want to be a musician and that does not interest you. So I think that it's important to ask ourselves those hard questions, especially when you're young, because everything is possible. Mm -hmm. I love it. I love it. I love, I just want to like wrap up the podcast with a bow with that. (laughs) But I, because you have taught so many students and, you know, you clearly have thought you have used your brain and asked yourself, better questions. You are constantly, like I see all the books in your background. I know y'all on the podcast can't see this, but I see all the books in the background. You clearly like going on an upward slope. And I think my final question is, what haven't I asked you that you think is really important for musicians to hear if they want to continue growing themselves as artists? Mm, That's a great question. What haven't you asked me? Okay, I won't think. I know you can edit, but I won't. I'll try not to think about it for too long. <laughs> um, oh, that's a great question. I don't know what you have not asked me. Because <laughs> we definitely covered a lot. And, and mm. really anything you could have said could fit there. I'm just curious if, if there's any other tips in there that, you know, our viewers can really munch on. Um, Because you are clearly full of a lot of incredible insight. Like, I want to listen to my own podcast Mm -hmm. and review this uh, so I can take notes on how to better further my musical journey. Because, yes, like, I'm in a weird half clinician, half musician role. But um, it's something that I I really, really take seriously. I think I was a musician before anything else. And um, I'm trying to figure out myself as an artist. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm really also asking this question for myself as well. I think that there could be many answers, but we, we really need to, I'm going to use that again because I'm trying to not repeat myself, but we need to take ownership of our learning experience. Go to concerts, listen to recordings. And sometimes I hear people and myself too have had those doubts like, I, I don't want to listen too much because I don't want to start copying. Mm-hmm. No, I think we're, we're listening and we're learning and we're getting inspiration. Um, but also taking the time and, and being patient to really uh, absorb all of these notions, see how they come together and really reflect on how it translates for us. Because too often we're looking, exactly for what you said, we're looking for these magic pills outside of us. And like I said, we need processes, some systems, and some concepts explained to us. But then once you take it inside and you really internalize it, what does the little voice tell you? And that works both for uh, absorbing technique, 
musicality in in making life decisions also so that's great that's awesome well i love it i absolutely love it now if anyone is listening to this podcast and you're thinking yeah i definitely need to work with renee she sounds incredible (laughs) and i practice anytime the wind blows and i'm not really sure of what i'm doing and she just sounds like a really great resource to have where can they find you Everything is at mindoverfinger.com. So I, and I also have, of course, the Mind Over Finger podcast. Mm -hmm. And I have the Facebook, the Mind Over Finger tribe on Facebook, which is my my, uh, private group where I show up once a week and I answer questions and I do some live videos. But yeah, everything is at mindoverfinger.com. And um, currently I'm teaching two programs over the summer. Uh, There's the music mastery experience that I'm really excited about because it's really Everything that I've learned, every all of my, I mean, I don't know if I, I should call it wisdom, but it's all my oh, it's wisdom. It's good. All my, all my, uh, my teaching model and um, a lot of the concepts that I've been working on for years, uh, put together in the program with a little bow on top. That's going to come back in the in the winter probably, but uh, starting in the fall, I'm also going to do some private coaching, and uh, you know if any audition preparation or transforming your practicing and all of these things. And uh, also um, probably an online violin studio coming up soon. So there's a lot of things in the work. It's all, it's all going to be at mindoverfinger.com. Awesome. We'll link it all in the description. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you so much for having me. And, and I'm excited to be here because I feel like your work is so important and your enthusiasm is so great, your creativity and your shedding light on, on something that is really needed for our community. So I'm so happy to be here. Thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate it. And any musician listening to this again, just look at, just type in mind over finger and you will find everything you want from Dr. Gautier. Thank you so much for your time and musicians. If you're listening to this, actually start to think. Thank you guys so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this chat with David Cartolano from the Condition Musician podcast. You can find the show on your favorite podcasting app and I'll have some links for you in the show notes. I would love to know what your favorite takeaways from today's conversation were, so please get in touch with me and with David. I'm Mind Over Finger on both Instagram and Facebook, and he's the Condition Musician on Instagram. And why not share the podcast with your friends and tag us so we know you enjoyed the episode. And I'm really excited to announce that David is going to be back here on the Mind Over Finger podcast next month to talk about all things physical well-being for better performance. So catch that episode on October 9. A last few words before I wrap this up. As I've mentioned at the beginning, the Music Mastery Experience is starting this Monday. It's a transformational journey to loving the practice room, rocking the stage, winning the job, and taking your career to new heights. This is a three-month-long, highly personalized group coaching program where I'll show you how to implement mindful and effective practice techniques, make them habits, and get results. I've spent years developing my deep practice model and putting it to the test in my own career and with my students, and I'm so proud to share it with you through my music mastery experience. Over the course of 12 weeks, you will learn to direct your attention and your intention. We will explore efficient practicing systems, performance preparation methods that give you massive results, and will overhaul your mindsets so you can experience wonderful music making day after day. You will reach a superior level of productivity and performance. I have created for you an environment that's going to provide you with tons of inspiration and motivation. So if you're looking to elevate your practice and performance, the Music Mastery Experience is perfect for you. It kicks off this Monday, so book a call today and let's talk about your goals, your dreams, and how the Music Mastery Experience can help you get there. You can find more information at mindoverfinger.com slash MME. And of course, I'll have that link for you in the show notes. 
So that's it for today. Again, thank you, and à bientôt. Thank you.